Welcome to My Savior Lives Northland. This program offers you the opportunity to participate in a service of worship led by local pastors and members of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. MSL Northland is locally produced with a message for the world. Welcome to My Savior Lives Northland. My name is Pastor Brad Felix and pastor of Trinity and Grace Lutheran Churches in Virginia and Chisholm, Minnesota. Today's service is being recorded at First Lutheran Church in Ely, Minnesota, and we are hoping you are having a great Labor Day weekend up here. Anyway, this 13th Sunday after Pentecost sermon theme is on the cost of discipleship, and our message is entitled, A Love-Hate Thing. You can also watch this service on Vimeo at MSL Northland on our website, mslnorthland.com. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, <laughs> we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father, most merciful God. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die on the cross for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. Well, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O merciful Lord, you did not spare your only Son, but delivered him up for us all. Grant us courage and strength to take up the cross and follow him, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the 13th Sunday after Pentecost is from Deuteronomy chapter 30. And it reads, See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, 
by walking in his ways and keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules. Then you shall live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. This is the word of the Lord. And we say, thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from Philemon, verses 1 through 21. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints, and I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, indeed useful to you and to me, and I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel." But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, Charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my soul in Christ, confident of your obedience. I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. This is the word of the Lord, and we say... Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is according to St. Luke, the 14th chapter. And we say, glory to you, O Lord. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, 
he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the gospel of the Lord. And we say, praise to you, O Christ. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today, Lord, we pray for our children as they leave summer behind and begin another school year. We pray the word of God over each one of them. Over all their steps, may you be a lamp for their feet and a light for their path. Over all their friendships, may they choose their friends wisely and may their friends refresh their souls. May they do everything in love, Lord, as you have loved them. Over all their trials, may they be strong and courageous, remembering that you go with them and will not leave or forsake them. You are their refuge and fortress. Over all their triumphs, may they always give thanks to you, Lord, who gives victory through Christ Jesus. Through every day, Lord, may they remember the privilege of an education as they dwell in your shelter and rest in your shadow. For you are the Almighty God, and your word stands forever. Amen. Now, do what you're baptized to do. Open your heart and receive it. Grace and peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Anyone remember them bumper stickers saying, hate is not a family value? I, of course, didn't get it till I heard those who spoke against immorality, supposedly, taking over society described as uh, hate mongers. Well, just because you argue against something doesn't mean that you hate those doing it. Jesus and John the Baptist even called folks a brood of vipers, but obviously loved those misguided people. No, if you really care about people, you'll try to warn them about dangers to body and soul. Yet here Jesus says something tough for us to comprehend. Are Christians really supposed to hate our families and even our own life? Well, that depends on what you mean by hate. Today we think of hate as, what, taking away people's rights, right? To do what they want. Hate can mean discriminating against someone on, uh, and for various reasons, whether it be skin color, uh, vocation, worldview, etc., And obviously, if by hate you mean to deny them a place in society, 
free speech and or human dignity, then hate is dead wrong. And it's wrong to, of course, capriciously make fun of, yell, humiliate, and attempt to dehumanize people. It's wrong to lie and or deceptively misrepresent them before others. And it's wrong to treat folks differently and deny them love because you don't, oh, like, like their looks or, or the things that they either can't or won't change about themselves. And it's wrong for us to do anything contradicting or denying the fact that, yes, in Christ's love, everyone is someone. And after all, Jesus said what? He said, love, love your enemies. Do good to those who hurt you. And if you only love those who are loving you in return, what good is that? Of course, he says, everybody does that. Love those who you don't love, and I'll reward you in heaven. But Jesus didn't say that hate word in today's gospel, you might ask. Didn't he? Well... In Greek, it's pronounced meseo. If you don't hate others and yourself, you can't be his disciple. Is this true? How'd that get in the Bible? Hmm. Well, to understand this passage, we got to understand the world, the Bible world, the world of the Bible. There were no lukewarm words back then. There's no word describing liking someone. Your word choice was love or hate. Nothing in between. And I understand even today, there's no Arabic word for like. And perhaps that's one reason the Arabic world still has so much tension today, especially among Muslims. The ancient world talked in absolutes. Genesis 29, it, it says that Jacob had what? Two wives, Rachel and Leah. And it says that Jacob, he loved Rachel more than Leah. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, we read, he allowed her to have a child. But Rachel was barren without a child. You see the comparison between loving something less? Jacob, he took care of wife Leah. He stayed with, honored his vows looked after her and together raised their children, but he had more feeling for Rachel. Yet being loved less is called then being hate or despised, so there's no wiggle room. Jesus told money-grubbing Pharisees in Luke chapter 16, he says, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise and that word again is maseo the other you can't serve god and money so jesus doesn't say the servant will yell at the other master call him names discredit or try to destroy his business but he will have to obey the one master and ignore the other's orders and this is what the Bible calls then hate. So when families, friends, uh, or even your own sinful flesh says, follow something other than Jesus or God's word, you, by the Holy Spirit's lead, will say no to it, deny it, and stop listening to it. You won't follow Jesus and obey another's voice. He won't take second place to anyone or thing. And that's what it means to be God. We make Jesus, the Word, into something less than God when not following Him. So in His words, we hate Him. So He says, hate others, meaning willingly renounce everything and everybody that keeps us from following Christ. Now, before labeling this as extreme, this Labor Day morning, imagine what it'd be like if we honored all our commitments, like Jesus expects us to honor him as our God. When a man and a woman married, they what? They honor each other for life, not letting anything take the place of their commitment. 
They'd forgive and wouldn't drift away from each other. Their mutual love and appreciation would only grow till death do they meet again. Or when taking a job, you fully trust your employer. He'd treat you with dignity since you've committed a major portion of your life to him. He wouldn't, he wouldn't hold back or haphazardly uh, fire you. Yeah, he, he, you would never, in return, trash talk him, and he'd know you're doing your very level best to produce that product or service the company offers. And parents, oh, imagine this one. If your kids honored you the way Jesus expects us to honor him, there'd be what? No sassing back. Imagine that. No sassing back or arguments with them. Discipline. Oh, it would be a joy because kids would obey parents and parents wouldn't overburden the kids with expectations nor provoke their children to anger. And kids? Oh, Parents would have their marital relationship boundaries, but still give you the undivided attention as appropriate and wouldn't leave you out of all their fun. So, boy, taking a look at that picture, or those pictures I just shared with you, and you take a look at the world, it's very easy to say, wow, what a messed up world we live in, huh? Seeing people diligently, Diligently honoring their commitments. What? We'll, we, we, we'll th what do we do oftentimes? We'll throw a party and we'll say, look at that. What an unusually faithful person. Thing is, putting Christ first, that ought to be the norm. So yes, if you're wondering what being a Christian entails, Jesus says what? Count the cost. Confess. Repent. Follow me. So there's no responding Jesus, you go on. I'm going to hang out here for a while, and I'll catch up with you later. Doesn't work. There's no covering over our sinful behavior. It's exposed to God for what it is. Jesus says, give it up, confess, repent. You can't follow me and act that way. And if we want to follow Jesus, yes, it'll make a big difference in life. And folks will often, yes, see that difference. There's no time for not loving others. And it's true, one way we'll love people is warning them. Warning them of what an unrepentant sinful life results in. Damnation. So we'll be alarmed. Yes, we will. When sexual immorality is promoted... Or when they refuse to give up behaviors that hurt others or steal, cheat, and lie. That kind of living, yes, is to be exposed for what it is. Because it's misleading people and causes great stumbling and ultimately suffering. For that person and for everyone possibly around. And it's not hateful to express what God said about it. So yes, we... Christians, we'll be passive in justification, but active in sanctification. Now let me explain. There's a cost. Yes, there's a cost to being a Christian. Salvation is God's free gift. When Jesus died on the cross, he took all your sins on himself. There's no mistake about that. And when the Holy Spirit brings someone to believe in God's love for the world, in Christ crucified's love, what will they do? Well, yes, the Holy Spirit in them, they will confess their sin. They will repent and be and are declared not guilty by, God, by God's grace. God saves us. We don't add to or work for salvation. But the Christian is always to follow Jesus. And that's where we're called to be active. We're to love God. By what? By obeying the commandments. By walking in His ways. And loving others. By, yes, serving our neighbor. And that's whoever's around us. Or is in, gen in genuine need. They may be our friends or enemies. And we're to love them regardless. And serve them. And that's the cost of being 
a Christian. Jesus says, whoever doesn't bear his own cross and come after me can't be my disciple. Now, to his original audience, this would mean, will you think so little of the life that God gave you, you'd accept Roman crucifixion for the sake of being my disciple? Oh, they all knew about crucifixion. They all grew up watching him. They'd seen numerous people tortured, killed this way, but they followed Jesus regardless. And they weren't disappointed. To us today, it means, are you ready to put everything, everything else on hold and follow me? Bad things may happen to you. Jesus says, trust me. Folks may, yep, call you names. Friends may despise, forsake you. Jesus says, don't worry about them. Listen to me love and yes pray for them regardless and yes you'll have to help people you don't like being around jesus said hey he said i did that for you and you're gonna have to hold your tongue and maybe even open your wallet jesus says what you've done for the least of these my brethren you've done unto me oh and by the way there's nothing that'll bring you more joy than I can, says Jesus. And yes, that's the cost of following Jesus. Are you still going to follow him who gave his perfect life to call you perfect on Judgment Day? There's no other path that'll bring more peace in the soul, more joy in the heart, and the security of knowing that you know that you know who you really are and what you're here to do than receiving and following him. So go ahead, count the cost, but follow, keep following Jesus. And may the peace of Christ that passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. May all God's people say, Amen. And amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you've set before us life and good, death and evil. May your Holy Spirit continually direct us to life and good while loving the Lord our God, ever walking in his ways and by keeping his commandments, statutes, and his rules to him who has borne our sins, that we might receive grace, remission of sins, and abundant life here and forever. We pray you to strengthen our faith by your Holy Spirit and lead us to everlasting life and salvation through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And not just mouth and words, but with everything that we are, always keep us thoughtfully, mindfully, and heartfully praying our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you for joining us in worship today. If you would like more information about a church in your area, or if this program has been a blessing to you, please send comments and contributions to MSL Northland, CO Mount Olive Lutheran Church, 2012 East Superior Street, Duluth, Minnesota, 55812. We appreciate your support and prayers for this ministry. My Savior Lives Northland is a production of Stokes Media House in conjunction with the Wisconsin and Minnesota North Districts of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and supported by viewers like you.